first five minutes and then you've got to stop. I think so. Uh, maybe that's what uh, the arbiter was signaling, signaling about uh, just over the shoulder there. Uh, we've now had 10 minutes of action and uh, the players or the spectators forbidden. Uh, These two, I, I did predict that there would be fireworks. I did not predict this uh, semi terrash opening, which is one of the most solid responses you can have against a D4. So shall we find out how we got here? Yeah, let's uh, quickly whiz through the moves. Still a well-known position until this last one, which is a bit, bit mysterious and uh, a bit puzzling, as you uh, coined it, Yvanka. So we see D4 and a transposition to the Queen's Gambit declined once Black puts a pawn on D5. Uh, and, uh, not taking this pawn, uh, which would lead to uh, a different variation, C5 instead. And as you said, the semi tarash where you trade off uh, a set of pieces very early on, the knights disappear now. Not just that, pawns disappear in the center. Black gives a check, the ships off the board as well. So white has this big pawn center, but the fact that there are fewer pieces on the board means that they are maybe less of a strength than usual. The space of the chair and pawn to h3. What is that all about? That is very mysterious. It's not as if black's threatening to play bishop g4. <laughs> There's a pawn on e6. Uh, what? Does h3 contribute to white's position? Normal moves would have been to develop the bishop to d3 or c4. Exactly. To move the rook uh, to a more central square. Those would look like productive ideas, but h3 just looks like a waste of tempo. It certainly does. I mean, I've seen h3 played, but that normally happens after the bishop has been developed to c4 and the castles and the rooks have centralized, and then you kind of play a waiting move. So it feels a bit odd to do it right now. Um, okay, so maybe. I mean, Black actually only has one turn, right, as well. So it's not like Black is that sophisticated about it. It's just true. develop the knight and then just develop light square bishop and... Uh, which square do you want to use for the Black Knight? I'm trying to think, because you see, normally I play this on the white side and I'm just going bishop c4 and castling and then they go, they do their moves and now I can't remember what their moves are. I think it's knight, it's knight c6. It's 97, 97, isn't it? Yeah, it depends on white setup actually. I think uh, the move order trick might be quite interesting here. Uh, we see Anishgiri now approaching the board. Hikaru for a moment. Uh, okay, we see him walking away now, but he was looking at the score sheet. He was like, I think he was as puzzled, as confused as us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was like, when did H3 happen? Why did H3 happen? Um, so usually in this position, I think if white puts a bishop on D3, then the black knight often comes out to c6 very quickly to attack this pawn. Okay. Um, whereas if the bishop comes out to c4, then black often puts the knight on d7. Yeah. Uh, because the d4 pawn is not really attacked, and then you play with d6, bishop b7. So I'm, I'm assuming here h3, if knight to c6, then white might have other ideas like putting a bishop on b5, um, or maybe even on c4. So you've tricked black and you put the knight on d7, now you could put your bishop on d3 and happily. Uh, say the d4 pawn will not be under attack, so I think it's a bit of a waiting game, but the big question is what happens after black plays b6, which is always the part of the plan, I think. Yeah, it is always the part of the plan, as far as I know, especially the things that I'm religiously playing bishop c4, so I'm like, they always do knight d7, bishop b6, bishop b7 there, so, okay. Now I think we're unlikely to see bishop c4, because uh, after bishop b7 already there's a problem uh, on this e4 pawn. No, no, he's, he's waited again. Wait again, rook to d1. Really, really surprising stuff. Now, how does he intend to meet bishop to b7? Eric Geisy, look at him, he's like, oh, I didn't prepare this one. <laughs> and uh, Eric Geisy loves to prep uh, his lines. Meanwhile, look at the arbiter. Just, uh, we see Arno there, the arbiter. Uh, he was signaling to someone on the balconies, <laughs> maybe saying, no more photos. Oh. We're done with that. Yes, no photo for you today. Uh, actually, I shared. Are you allowed photos in the
in the meantime, we're going to rush straight into a very dramatic game uh, in the open section. Um, I think we'll also head to the women's where there's still some time scrambles incoming, but look at this king, Yamanka. There's a black king on b4. It started its journey on g8, uh, even h7, just half a dozen moves ago, and it's literally made its way bang, 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 over to b4, literally walking through the eye of the storm. <laughs> yes, uh, and talking about stormy weather, I mean, is that king going to survive out there on the rocks? Oof, who knows, <laughs> I think it's the answer. I just want to point out, white played rook to d7 in this position, uh, Predka still hustling, uh, he's a piece down, uh, he's a whole bishop down, he invested that for the attack, but rook takes bishop, I just want Point out a brilliant tactic spotted by Eridice Roti. This bishop would have been met strongly by a simple retreat, knight to a5. There's no checks. The white rook is hit, and there's a threat of checkmate. There's suddenly, a turnaround yeah. uh, where it's black's attack that is decisive. So, rook to d7. And yeah, all bets are off. This is just a crazy position. Yes. Whoa, I, I love that move. And well, Eric Icy can still utilize that idea, right? By just moving the queen to the e5 square. Or uh, yep. am I missing? I am missing something big because now the uh, queen can uh, come to e seven and check so you can capture the bishop. But, but this time oh, but this time there's knight d6. Uh, oh, consequences. Consequences. A square has been vacated, freed up, and suddenly not just a fork, but remember checkmate in one. The black queen still I think that's why she needs to stay on this diagonal. I think you found the best move you might go. Queen uh, covers h2. Um, so it feels like Eric is still a favourite. He's got a couple of minutes more on the clock. He looks like cold as ice right now, just super calm. Uh, and if he plays the move queen e5, he should still be in the driver's seat. But of course you have to reckon with them. Yeah. It's like knight to f3 again, rejoining the battle. And if black is forced to put the queen on a1 just to continue uh, and then save the bishop, then of course uh, you don't play a move like that willingly. Uh, well, imagine a king on b4, queen on a1, and somehow still <laughs> safe enough. You know, I have a suspicion that king might find itself checked to a2. <laughs> <laughs> Why not continue? Why not get greedy? Much on pawns. Uh, okay, should we go to a, uh, some games where the clock situation is even more dramatic? We see just the ticker under our cameras, actually. Oh, oh. Well, we have another result. Um, which game is this? Okay, this is uh, Predka against Eric I see that game ended in a draw. So whilst wow. this game is massively complicated, let's take a look at the ending of uh, this game, because what happened here? Wow, Arjun sacrificed his queen, incredible stuff, just to force a draw. Um, this was the bailout option. Um, we were advocating queen e5, maybe slightly preferable for black, but so complicated with no time on the clock. Um, in the end, he played the pragmatic knight to d2. Uh, not an obvious one, giving up the black queen uh, in order to give a check, and a draw was agreed here because king h2 would be met by another knight check, and the perpetual dance between king and knight would continue. No way to escape. No, in, the, in, in the end, it was a fair result because what a game it was. I mean, objectively, that sacrifice that Predka did wasn't correct, but on a practical level, 